The P-51 Mustang was the weapon that broke the back of the Luftwaffe. It was the pride of America, a symbol of freedom. But here is the secret that history books often gloss over. The man who designed it, he wasn't American. He was born in Germany. He had once worked for the very enemy he was now building planes to destroy. This is the story of how an immigrant engineer and a British genius built the plane that won the war. 1940. The sky over London belongs to the Nazis. The Royal Air Force is holding the line, but they are bleeding. They are losing planes faster than they can build them. Desperate, the British Purchasing Commission travels to New York. They have a checkbook and a single question for American factories. What can you sell us right now? They go to a company called North American Aviation. They asked for the Curtis P-40, a solid, reliable, but mediocre fighter. The president of the company, Dutch Kindleberger, looks at his chief engineer, Edgar Schmoud. Schmoud is an interesting character. Born in Germany, he served in the Austrian army in World War I. He watched the early German planes fly. He knows how the German engineering mind works. And he hates the P-40. It's obsolete, Schmoud tells the British. If we build that, by the time it reaches England, the Germans will blow it out of the sky. Schmoud makes a bold pitch. Don't buy the P-40. Let me design something new. Something aerodynamic. Something that slices through the air like a knife. The British are furious. They don't have time for experiments. They need planes now. So, they give him an ultimatum. A deadline so tight it sounds like a joke. You have 120 days. If the prototype isn't rolling out of the hangar in 120 days, the deal is off. 120 days. That is four months to invent a fighter plane from scratch. Schmood and his team work day and night. They sleep under their desks. Schmood is obsessed with drag. He wants the plane to be slippery. He uses a radical new technology, the laminar flow wing. Most wings are curved on top to create lift. Schmood pushes the curve further back. It reduces turbulence. It reduces drag. On paper, it is a masterpiece. September 9th, 1940. 102 days later. They beat the deadline by three weeks. The plane is beautiful. It looks fast just sitting on the tarmac. But a plane needs an engine. And this is where the trouble begins. The Americans installed the Allison V1710 engine. It is a good engine. For a truck. Or a low-flying attack plane. But it lacks one critical component. A two-stage supercharger. The test pilots love it. It is smooth. It is agile. The British order 300 of them immediately. They call it the Mustang. But when the first Mustangs arrived in England in 1941, the RAF pilots took them up to fight the Germans. And the smile disappears. Above 15,000 feet, the Mustang is a sitting duck. The engine gasses for air. It loses power. It becomes sluggish. In aerial warfare, altitude is life. He who flies highest shoots first. The Luftwaffe pilots in their Messerschmitts and Focke-Wulfs simply climb to 20,000 feet and look down. They laugh. The Mustang can't touch them. The RAF is disappointed. They have a beautiful aerodynamic sports car with a broken engine. They relegate the Mustang to army cooperation duties, taking photos, shooting trains, low-level ground attack. It is a humiliation. The most advanced airframe in the world is being used as a glorified crop duster. And the US Army? They aren't even interested. They stick with their P-47 Thunderbolts and P-38 Lightnings. They ignore Schmood's creation completely. But in a hangar in Hucknall, England, a British test pilot named Ronnie Harker flies the Mustang. He feels the aerodynamics. He feels the smoothness of the controls. He lands, 
climbs out of the cockpit and turns to the engineers at Rolls-Royce. He says, This airplane is not a failure. It's just holding its breath. He calls over the genius of British engines, the man who made the Spitfire fly, Stanley Hooker. Hooker looks at the Mustang. Then he looks at the Rolls-Royce Merlin 61 engine, the engine that powers the Spitfire Mark IX. The Merlin 61 has a two-stage supercharger. It breathes thin air like it's oxygen. Hooker wonders, the Mustang is designed by a German-American. The engine is British. They are two different worlds. The measurements are different. The bolts are different. But what if? He calls his team. Rip the nose off that Mustang, he says. We are going to perform a heart transplant. They told him it wouldn't fit. They told him the cooling system would fail. But Hooker didn't care. He knew that if he could marry the slickest American body with the most powerful British engine, he wouldn't just build a fighter. He would build a monster. 1942. The Rolls-Royce engineers are attempting surgery. They have stripped the nose of the American Mustang. They are trying to jam a massive 27-litre V12 Rolls-Royce Merlin engine into a space designed for a smaller American engine. It doesn't fit. It is like trying to put a lion into a dog kennel. There are wires everywhere. Pipes are being bent. The mechanics are cursing. If this fails, they have ruined a perfectly good airplane. If it succeeds, they might just win the war. Stanley Hooker watches the chaos. The biggest problem isn't the size, it is the heat. The Merlin engine runs hot, incredibly hot. In the Spitfire, there are radiators under the wings. But the Mustang has a strange design, a large scoop under the belly. Hooker achieves something brilliant. He looks at the math of the scoop. When air enters the scoop, it cools the engine coolant. The air gets hot. Hot air expands. And when it expands, it needs to escape. If they shape the exit duct correctly, the escaping hot air will act like a mini jet engine. It is called the Meredith effect. Instead of the radiator slowing the plane down with drag, the heat actually generates thrust. It was unintentional genius. Edgar Schmoud had designed the perfect cooling system, but he needed Hooker's engine to make it sing. The marriage was consummated. The Mustang X was ready. Captain Ronnie Harker straps in. He fires the starter cartridge. The sound is different. The old Allison engine chugged. The Merlin growls. It is a deep, throaty roar that shakes the ground. He pushes the throttle. The plane leaps off the runway. Harker pulls back on the stick. Usually, at 15,000 feet, the Mustang would start to wheeze. Harker passes 15,000. The engine is still pulling. 20,000 feet, still pulling. 25,000 feet. He is now in the domain of the Luftwaffe. He levels out at 30,000 feet. He opens the throttle wide. The numbers are staggering. The old Mustang topped out at 390 miles per hour. This new Frankenstein fighter? It hits 440 miles per hour. It climbs faster. It flies higher. It burns less fuel. Harker lands the plane, jumps out, and famously shouts, They shouldn't build another airplane. They should just build this one. The Meredith effect gave the P-51 extra speed just from cooling air. Is this the smartest engineering trick of World War II? The news travels back to America, to North American aviation. Edgar Schmoud looks at the British data. He smiles. He knew his airframe was perfect. He just needed the horsepower. But there is a logistical nightmare. Rolls-Royce can barely build enough Merlins for the Spitfires and Lancaster bombers. They can't supply the American army too. So a deal is struck. The blueprints for the Merlin engine are sent to Detroit, to the Packard Car Company. This is where the Axis powers lost the war, not on the battlefield, but in the factory. Packard took the hand-built British engine and redesigned it for mass production. They built them by the thousands. The P-51B is born. American body, British heart, built in Detroit. 
It was the ultimate hybrid. But it arrived just in time, because over Germany a slaughter was happening. 1943. The US 8th Air Force is trying to bomb Germany into submission by day, but they are dying. The B-17 bombers are tough, but they are alone. Their escorts, the P-47s and Spitfires, have short legs. They have to turn back at the German border because they run out of fuel. The moment the fighters turn back, the Luftwaffe vultures swoop in. In one week, Black Week of October 1943, the Americans lost 148 bombers, 1,500 men, gone. The generals stop the raids. They cannot sustain the losses. They need a miracle. They need a fighter that can fly all the way to Berlin and back. They looked at the new P-51 Mustang. They looked at the fuel consumption figures. They didn't believe them. Check it again, the general said. Schmoud had added fuselage fuel tanks behind the pilot. It was dangerous. If hit, the pilot sat on a bomb, but it gave the plane incredible range. With dropping tanks under the wings, the Mustang could fly for 1,600 miles. He could go to Berlin, fight for 15 minutes, and fly home. March 1944. The bombers launch again. The German radar operators see the massive formation. They scrambled the Luftwaffe. Hermann Göring, the head of the Luftwaffe, laughs. He thinks the bombers are alone. He thinks it will be another turkey shoot. The German pilots climb to intercept. They see the fighter planes protecting the bombers deep inside Germany. They assume they are short-range planes that made a navigational error. But then, the fighters drop their external fuel tanks. The silver planes turn to fight. The German pilots freeze. They recognise the silhouette. It's not a Spitfire. It's not a Thunderbolt. It's the Mustang. And it's over Berlin. Years later, Hermann Göring would say, When I saw Mustangs over Berlin, I knew the war was lost. The hunter had become the hunted. But the Mustang wasn't just killing planes. It was about being given a new mission. A mission so dangerous that the pilots called it the graveyard shift. By mid-1944, the P-51 Mustang had done what no other plane could do. It had broken the Luftwaffe. The German pilots were demoralised. They knew that no matter how high they climbed or how deep they hid in Germany, the silver ghosts would find them. General Eisenhower famously said, the Mustang is the plane that gave us the air. But having won the air, the Allies now wanted the ground. The Mustang pilots were given a new, terrifying order. Go down to the deck and destroy everything that moves. Mustang pilots would drop their altitude and roam the German countryside like wolves. Their target wasn't planes, it was logistics. Trains, trucks, barges, bridges. The P-51 was armed with six 50 caliber machine guns. When fired together, they didn't just punch holes, they tore metal apart. The German rail network was the lifeline of the Nazi war machine. It moved tanks, fuel and soldiers to the front. The Mustang pilots severed that lifeline. Gun camera footage from 1944 shows train after train exploding in clouds of steam. It was dangerous work. Flying at 400 miles per hour at treetop level meant that one mistake, one telephone wire, one lucky shot from a soldier with a rifle, and it was over. But it worked. By D-Day, the German army was paralysed. They couldn't move their tanks because the Mustangs were watching. This tactic was so effective that German train drivers refused to work during the day. They would only move at night. But the war wasn't over. The Nazis had one final card to play. The jet. The Messerschmitt ME262. We talked about this plane in our Kelly Johnson story. It was 100 miles per hour faster than the Mustang. When the Mustang pilots first saw it, they were stunned. It looked like it was from the future. It had no propellers. It flew so fast they couldn't even get their guns on it. The P-51, the king of the sky, was suddenly obsolete. But the Mustang pilots had something the German technology didn't. 
numbers, and coming. They realised the jet had a weakness. It was slow to take off and slow to land. The Mustang pilots developed a brutal tactic, rat catching. They wouldn't fight the jets in the air. They would hover over the German airfields, waiting like vultures. The moment the German jets lowered their landing gear, vulnerable and slow, the Mustangs would dive. It wasn't a dogfight, it was an execution. Among the pilots was the legendary Chuck Yeager, the man who would later break the sound barrier. He shot down a ME-262. He proved that the piston engine could still kill the jet engine if the pilot was smart enough. The Mustang held the line until the very end. May 1945. Germany surrenders. The P-51 Mustang had flown over 200,000 sorties. It claimed nearly 5,000 enemy aircraft destroyed in the air. It was the highest score of any Allied fighter. But the story of the Mustang isn't just about the kill count. It is a story of collaboration. Think about it. The body was designed by a German immigrant who fled America. The engine was designed by the British genius who built the Spitfire. The production was done by American auto workers in Detroit. It was the perfect synthesis of Allied power. While the Nazis were obsessed with purity and fighting alone, the Allies won because they mixed their best ideas together. Today, the P-51 Mustang is the most coveted warbird in the world. When you hear that whistle, the distinctive scream of the gun ports and the growl of the Merlin engine, you aren't just hearing a plane, you are hearing the sound that saved Europe. It was the plane that nobody wanted, the plane built in 120 days, the plane with the wrong engine, but in the end, it was the perfect weapon. Edgar Schmoud and Stanley Hooker proved that sometimes the parts are great, but the sum of the parts is unstoppable.